they start to cut the spam loose. To stay on schedule, the 130 meter long section must be cut free from the bridge and hanging from cables by nightfall. The crew uses oxyacetylene blow torches to sever large trusses. These horizontal support beams sit on each side. These trusses will go straight to the recyclers with the rest of the steel structure. The price of steel has risen dramatically in the past few years, and uh, we have 12,000 tons of steel here. There is a strong motivation to go and recycle that steel, sell it to a scrapper, who will then recycle that and make it into a new product that he can sell in the open market and make a buck. It will take nearly 1,000 truckloads to move all the steel from the bridge to the recycling yard in nearby Oakland. It can then be sold to manufacturers and made into anything from toys to automobiles, even a new bridge. The Carquinas will have a new life. It is a bridge with a future, but it also links these workers to the past. The last time this span received so much attention was 1927. It has stood so well for so long because its design was ahead of its time. When engineer D.B. Steinman designed the Carquinas, he had to contend with a serious concern, earthquakes. Just 20 years earlier, one of the most significant earthquakes of all time flattened San Francisco. The Great Quake of 1906 shook the ground for an entire minute, killing up to 3,000 people and reducing the city to ruins. Steinman knew he had to come up with some way to protect his bridge from future quakes. It is necessary to take such precautions as we could to make the structure as safe as possible against earthquake effects. To tie the parts of the structure together in the event of an earthquake, hydraulic buffers were provided. These hydraulic buffers were Steinman's answer. He designed them to absorb any shaking they were an engineering feature a half century before their time. The Carquinas' decommission provides engineer and bridge historian Professor Hassan Astana a unique opportunity to study Steinman's work close up. So when the earthquake comes, the time locks actually. So as far as we know, this was the first bridge that someone came up with the idea of putting dampers and hydraulic jacks to control seismic effect. It's like he is telling us the essence of what we do today, 80 years earlier. He just saw it. No one knew for sure if Steinman's buffers would work. The Cypress Valley buckled onto It wasn't until 1989 that they were put to the ultimate test. The upper deck crashing to the bottom deck. The Loma Prieta earthquake registers 7.1 on the Richter scale. It knocks the nearby Bay Bridge out of service. But the 62-year-old Carquinas escapes unscathed. Now, all the engineering that went into building the Carquinas is reversed. After eight hours, workers finally cut the last of the horizontal supports. The span is currently connected by four pairs of vertical steel rods called I-bars, one pair on each corner. Workers secure lowering jacks to the top of each set of I-bars. The bottom of the span is then connected to the jacks through a series of steel cables, 19 on each corner. When the jacks are engaged and the eye bars cut, these cables will be all that holds up the 635 ton section of bridge. 
The jacks can then slowly lower the span. But the span will be an incredible strain, and never before has anyone used jacks to lower a bridge span. They do know that a jack failure could be catastrophic. The moment of reckoning finally arrives. Workers are ready to free the giant span of the Carquinas Bridge, and the four jacks now sit ready to take the weight. The crew prepares to lower the span. Scott Soldis calls the shots. The two riskiest parts of the operation are getting it up on the jacks and then actually touch down on the barges. There was many nights of waking up in the middle of the night and making mental notes of things that need to be done the next day. Your primary responsibility down here is going to be making sure that you're feeding out enough of the tail. Work together on that. It's a matter of uh, getting the right people in the right jobs at that point, not giving them too much information. Get the headphones on, get everybody in their place, and by 7 o'clock we should be lowering. Mechanic Hector Macias must keep the jacks working. Hey, Tim, it don't matter which way you stick the fork in. He'll personally oversee the two jacks on the north side. We have two different controllers, one on the south, one on the north. I'm on the north side taking care of both winches, east and west. Scott, do you have your radio on? Yeah, go ahead. Scott orders the jacks turned on for the first time. The jacks slowly take the slack out of the cables. Now a crucial moment. Before the jacks can lower the span, they must pull the span up so the cables are super tight. If there's any give when the eye bars are cut free, the 635-ton stretch of steel will jerk on the jacks. That momentum could collapse the entire bridge. But lifting the span too much with the eye bars still attached could also cause a catastrophic collapse. If we come up on the load too high, and cause too much compression in the member. You could break the jacks, and you could break the supports, which are holding up the bridge at that point. Everything and everyone would be taken out. The jacks and cables now look to be taking the weight of the span. David orders the eye bars cut. From here, the only way forward is down. There's a point of no return. As soon as we cut the eye bar and transfer the loads onto the strands, then that's it. We have to lower the bridge. They sever the last eye bar. Now the cables alone support the full weight of the span. The entire 635-ton section swings free and lies at the mercy of the wind. To bring the center span down safely, everything must come together at once. The weather, the equipment, the engineering, the current, and the tides. It takes a perfect set of circumstances, and nothing can be rushed. Scott orders the jack operators to stand by. This time, they won't lift the span they'll lower it. The fate of the operation and the lives of those on the bridge depend on the jack's ability to perform. Hector, go ahead and send your jack up to 16 and hold. First, the four jack pistons extend. North side, 16 inches to the top. All right, hold right there, I'll get right back to you. Next, metal forks determine which part of the jack grips the cables either the top or the bottom. North side, bring it to the top. Now, when the pistons retract, 
the cables should lower the bridge span 40 centimeters. North side forks are in, ready to come down. All right, north and south side, both sides down. 10 4, coming down. The head then will retract 16 inches, lowering the bridge to 16 inches. In one smooth motion, the span makes its first move toward the awaiting barges. Jay, you got a copy? Got this four, step by. Jay, can I get a measurement on the north side? It's like using a rope to lower a bucket down a well. No pulley, just one arm's length at a time. Four, I'm going back up. Removing the lower forks clamps the cables in place, freeing the jacks to reach up and repeat the process. It's a very repetitive thing. We move the jacks a certain way, put the forks in, take the forks out, and the strands lower the bridge. So far, the system works. The jacks handle the weight of the 635-ton span. They have a tight deadline to meet. The channel can only be closed for 48 hours. At the current speed, it'll take a full 10 hours just to lower the span, and they still must secure it to the barges. That's when there are no problems, and there's always one little thing that goes wrong. It just takes a long time. The team starts to fall behind schedule. Suddenly, 48 hours doesn't seem like enough time. A little slower than Scott had hoped for, but we will get our alert. We need to bottom out on this end first. In addition to the slow speed of descent, there's a new problem. The center span begins to tilt. The span is only strong when vertical. If it gets seriously out of alignment, there will be too much pressure on key girders and the whole span will fold like a house of cards. It happened before with the construction of the Quebec Bridge in 1907. The Quebec Bridge is nearly complete, 270 meters and 18,000 tons, when the south arm of the bridge collapses under its own weight. 86 workmen are on the bridge when it buckles, 75 perish. After the tragedy, it takes 10 years to rebuild the bridge. But just as the jacks begin lifting the span up from the water, disaster strikes again. The Quebec Bridge has a single suspended span. It collapsed twice, and they almost got it completely done. And when they were lifting the suspended span into place, one of the jacks failed, and the entire suspended span collapsed. The second mishap kills another 13 workers. Workers bringing down the center spans of the Carquinas Bridge face the same life-threatening danger. And suddenly, that nightmare scenario starts to inch all too close. We're about uh, eight inches tilted uh, east to west, so the west side's about eight inches lower than the east side. And it's just something that's happening with the northwest jack. He seems to be stroking a little further each time. We need to identify the problem. With every centimeter the span falls out of line, it becomes less stable and more prone to collapse. Yeah, well, that, it doesn't make sense. Jay gives the order, stop everything. The operation grinds to a halt with the span uneven and dangling precariously. If they keep going, the jacks lowering the 635-ton span of the Carquinas Bridge will tilt the span dangerously out of alignment. 